Hello friends. I've been working on some DIY upgrades and an external upgrade module for a simple stick welder recently. However, I'm not sure when my work will be completed. And that is why we're going to take a look at another yet closely related thing today. About two years ago, I took apart a simple stick welder and explained how it works. About a couple of weeks ago then, I took apart and repaired an old Mi'kmaq welder and also really went into the details there. Today we're now going to take apart this 250 amps ESAP brand Swedish TIG welder and figure out how it works. So just as a quick reminder, what's on a very superficial level? The most basic difference between the three different welding processes that we have named here so far. Well, stick welding or manual metal arc welding is done with an electrode holder and a welding electrode. You strike an arc on a workpiece that is connected via a ground clamp to your power supply and that can be done with AC or DC. Stick welding is often used on construction sites or outside because you don't have to carry a gas cylinder around with you. Mi'kmaq welding or gas metal arc welding requires a welding gun and a wire feeder and also either an inert gas, an active gas or a mixture of inert and active gas. MIG is for metal inert gas welding and is typically used for rather special jobs like welding titanium while the average guy in a shop actually does MUG welding, metal active gas welding and he does that for example with 100% CO2 or a mixture of inert and active gas like argon and CO2 like in this case here with 18% CO2 and there are many made up trade names for that like here Inarc K18, Corgon 18 and so on. And though they are technically two different welding processes, they can be done with the same welding machine while people mix them up all the time. TIG welding is an abbreviation for tungsten inert gas welding and that means that you're welding with a non-consumable tungsten electrode, an inert gas like argon, And then you also need a power supply, normally a DC power supply, where you now connect the ground clamp to the positive side of the power supply and, well, your welding torch to the negative side. You can also weld with AC and that is typically used for non-ferrous metals like welding aluminium. So there's obviously much more to say about all of these things. But from here on out, it's going to be about the electronic side of things and we're going to figure out how one of these TIG welders here actually works. And just for your information, I bought this particular machine a couple of months ago for very little money. It's broken and it hasn't been turned on in many weeks. And I think that all the capacitors inside are discharged. But I do not give any recommendation to do something like this yourself, nor can I guarantee your safety when you open one of these machines. So this is an ESAP brand LTF 250 and ESAP or ESAP that's a Swedish manufacturer of welding machines. This one might be maybe from the late 80s or early 90s and it's a DC only TIG welder for up to 250 amps. As you can see here it runs on 400 volt three phase power at 16 amps and it has four output jacks down here on the front panel and we can see by these symbols that it was built for MMA and TIG welding DC only you can see that by the plus and minus signs no switch to you know change it to AC and they also installed this little board here that can slide left or right and will always block either the positive or the negative output side of the machine and they did this uh, so that you would always pick the right jack for the welding process that you're using because as I said when TIG welding you typically connect the plus pole to the ground clamp and the workpiece while when using MMA it's the other way around. As you can see down here also these wheels here are obviously shopping cart wheels uh, like you might know them from Ikea for example. So some guy in the past installed shopping cart wheels to this machine. Might be that it never had wheels before that. Also it is painted green and I think ISAP machines are typically yellow so the paint job might also be not original. This large knob here can be used to adjust the welding current between 8 and 250 amps. And here you can see that this indicator moves much slower than the rotation of the actual button and that shows us that this is a multi-turn pot. And this switch here can be used 
to turn the machine on and then select between MMA and TIG. And we have two more knobs here. And well, the left one says Gas Nachspielzeit. That means gas past flow time. You know, the amount of time that the gas will flow after the welding arc is actually shut down. And Strom Abfallzeit, and that means downslope time. On the back, we have a chain here, and that's typically there for fastening a gas cylinder. However, this machine does not have a bottom plate on which to put the gas cylinder and might be another sign that this machine originally did not have wheels. Down here we can see that the gas tube is actually damaged and it would have to be replaced then. Up here we have two hooks and those can be used to, well of course, hoist these very heavy machines up because they're really hard to transport, for example, if you want to put them on your truck. So let us start now to open the enclosure and I first take off the top here and the first two components that we can see are a large fan and a wire wound power resistor. The purpose of the fan is of course to cool the machine, but most importantly, probably the transformer itself, because that is one of the cheapest ways to allow you to size down that transformer, which otherwise would have been even larger than it is already. So next I remove the two sheets on the sides so that we can take a closer look inside the bottom of the machine. And I will try of course to identify all the components here, but I'm especially also looking for faulty components that could have caused the malfunctioning of this machine. Now the first thing that I see here is the three-phase power cord entering the machine. And while the green and yellow protective earth conductor is actually connected to the enclosure, which is a good sign I guess, the neutral conductor is somewhat unprofessionally insulated at the end with just a bit of electrician's tape it seems and that could mean that this is actually not the original power cord but that this machine was originally hooked up to a 400 volt three phase 32 amp line in order to run it at its full power and the next component that we see here this blue tube here is apparently an automotive type ignition coil and this is obviously a high voltage circuit and it seems to be part of the high frequency start function of this machine and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Here on the left hand side we have a large heat sink with three rows of components on them and these are paralleled high current diodes as this heat sink and the components on it is one half of a three-phase rectifier bridge, somewhat similar again to what we saw in the MIGMAG welder. Also installed on this heatsink is a temperature switch or watchdog that will just switch off as soon as the temperature exceeds a certain limit and then it will need a while to switch on again after everything has cooled down. The contact here right next to it is unusually corroded, not quite sure why that happened. And up here, and much more importantly, we can see that the transformer is obviously damaged. One of the windings, at least, had to be overheated at some point for this to happen. I mean, you need a certain temperature for this kind of tape to literally burn through. Down here, again, closer to this high voltage circuit, we can see a broken capacitor. And this is a capacitor type that is typically used for RFI or EMI suppression, class Y or X capacitors. And especially these particular types of suppression caps here, I've seen them broken in so many different applications, especially in stuff from the 70s and 80s. Also, a lot of German audio equipment has this exact type of capacitor. And I don't know if it's a heat issue but they always seem to crack at some point. And this circuit board here that is installed slightly above the ignition coil is also part of that high frequency start function, I'm sure. But on that board, we can again see capacitors of that same type. And if I ain't mistaken, the one in the middle here is also broken. But before we go on, let's take a look here in the bottom and there we can see another, well, coreless inductor that was just wound from massive aluminium bar, it seems. And I think that it also works in conjunction with the high voltage circuitry around it. So I've now turned the machine around by 180 degrees and we're taking a look inside the other side of the machine and we find again a large heatsink, but this time other components are installed here. And behind these smaller heat sinks here that are sitting on the large heat sink are SCRs or thyristors that, well, 
they comprise the other half of our three-phase rectifier here. And I'll show you that in a schematic in just a minute. Now, on top of these SCRs, we also can find, again, little suppression caps, or in this case, probably rather integrated RC circuits or snubbers that contain the same kind of cap, though, and probably one or more is also damaged. We also find this large high current diode here, and I'll explain what that's good for later on as well. Now, here at the backside of the very output jacks, we again find these EMI RFI suppression caps and they as well seem to be broken and this time one of the leads is also I guess burned through or molten because maybe the capacitor shorted out well and the machine can deliver a lot of current so maybe that happened. And here we have a first look at the board that actually holds the SCR drivers and all the miscellaneous control electronics of the machine. And on the board, more of these same capacitors, some of them probably also broken. And down here we can also see that just bare strips of copper and aluminium were used here as conductors on the output side of the rectifier. And last but not least, between the two large heat sinks, we can get a glimpse at a massive inductor. And we'll take a look at that in just a minute after we have pulled it out of the enclosure. Because that is what I'm now going to do with everything here. The transformer is damaged and so are many other parts. So it was clear to me that I had to take a look at everything, figure out how it works together and then decide if this is worth repairing or if I would use the parts for something else. And in that process, a lot of bolts had to be unscrewed, nothing too spectacular. But one thing here, maybe you see that there are a lot of electrical connections between the device and the power transformer. And that there are also a bunch of smaller diodes connected to these clamps here. And we'll talk about these later in the video as well. So here is the transformer on the workbench and we can see some of the damage and also the large number of secondaries and connections to the secondary. If we turn the transformer around, we can see that it's really that one spot where the tape is burned all around that one leg of the transformer. And here we can see that those high current secondaries that are used for welding are obviously connected in a Y configuration with a neutral point or star point. That's where these aluminum bars, and that is what this is apparently made of, come together and are bolted together. And I'm just curious here and filing off a little bit of excess material just to see if it's really aluminium. In the next step, I try to, as carefully as possible, peel off that burnt up tape and to isolate the damage here. And just as a side note here, see the size comparison between your average microwave oven transformer and this professional welding transformer. And then imagine what people must think who are like professional welding machine designers when they see people like us trying to build machines with mods. So what I'm doing now is that I'm unwinding this secondary here and I'm counting 15 turns with a tap at two turns. And this is all made with one millimeter diameter magnet wire. So the next step would now be to first, again, insulate the, I guess that's the primary that we see here with some capped on tape. And then I could just rewind a new secondary with 15 windings at one millimeter diameter. One remaining question would be, of course, if the turns of the winding under that burned through winding are also damaged, but I don't think so. So here we have the entire three-phase rectifier bridge after I pulled it out of the enclosure. And the parts are, of course, installed on the two heat sinks. This is the side with the SCRs, but you still can't see them. They are white, and here you can maybe see their rims. And after removing one of those smaller heat sinks, I pulled one of them out of there. And this is what they look like. This type of enclosure was designed so that it could be fitted between two heat sinks under pressure. And before you had IGBTs or MOSFETs, this was really the way to go if you wanted to switch high currents, especially if we're talking about, well, mains powered electricity. And the little wire is going to the gate and that is, well, the means by which the SCR can be fired. So, and here we have our large inductor or choke. And as you can see, it is basically an iron core made from 
transformer lamination. And then we have three windings that are connected in series. So they effectively form one winding. And the material that was used here is simply a very malleable aluminum metal strip material. And well, of course, they would go for a certain conductive cross section area so that the metal would not completely overheat when 250 amps are flowing through it. But another remarkable thing here is that the core is not tightly closed or shut like in a transformer, but that you have two large air gaps in the core. So what's the deal with that? Well, the short answer here is watch my video SMPS tutorial part five, where I explained the basics of the magnetic circuit and introducing the air gap leads to a decrease in the overall permeability of the core. And that means that at the maximum rated current of 250 amps, this inductor will not yet go into magnetic saturation. You want to prohibit that from happening because then it would no longer act as an inductor. So, and of course, there are more interesting parts that I pulled out of the machine, like for example, the high voltage generator or well, the general control electronics and drivers inside the machine. But I did not yet have the time to properly reverse engineer these very complex circuits. But I think I have gathered enough information here to try to explain to you how this machine works on a basic level. But it's a Sunday evening and I want this to go online before the end of the weekend. So I've decided now to split this into two parts, this one being the first one, of course, and then part two will go online probably by the end of the week. And I hope you find this interesting enough to wait for that second part. See you soon.